And I'm thankful tonight for our first evening service of the Power Conference. Have Pastor Daniel Buchanan. He's no stranger to you here at Trinity. I love him and I appreciate him. He's the pastor of New Beginning Missionary Baptist Church there in Lenore, North Carolina on the Calico Road. I love that church. I love those people. They've loved my family. They've prayed for my family all of my life. And I love and appreciate them. I want you to give a big, warm Trinity welcome to Pastor Daniel Buchanan as he comes tonight to preach. Love you, Brother Wilson. You'll find the reading in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. God, this choir is just tremendous. Man, all this singing, wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. I appreciate good songs, and I appreciate people that can sing them and sing them right. These special numbers, a lot of old songs sung tonight, and then these new ones, and they're all worthy of the Lord. You've got to have a good song to be worthy of Christ, but I believe these are. So I appreciate, I was thinking yesterday, 30 years ago, I left this church and went down where I'm pastor. I make Brother Ralph, Ralph my pastor, Pastor Emeritus, and I guess I'd make Winston my pastor now. <laughs> I joined that church. This still would be my home church. And so I've never forgot you people. they some of the greatest people I've ever known go to this church. Amen. And a lot of them's in heaven now. Right. And uh, they're where they're supposed to be when you leave this world. But I don't thank God for you. And it's just tremendous to see the growth in your pastor, Brother Winston. I just stand and shake my head. I appreciate his tender heart and I appreciate his backbone like steel. He got it, buddy. He got a tender heart and he got a backbone. I like it, don't y'all? Amen. If he has to hit you, he'll cry over you. <laughs> hey, some of y'all standing up here. I seen little old David up here beside his mama, Kathy. Man, there's a day, David, I didn't know you'd ever be back up here. That's for sure. As many years ago. And they we're all headed that way where your daddy's at. And uh, Sister Musette and all these good people. And uh, one of the sad things is you young people never got to know some of the old people used to be here. Hey, Amen. You remember Sister Bailey? I mean, just go down the line, just great people. And uh, what they all had in common was their, their mutual love for God and for one another. And uh, you can't ever go wrong. If you're going to err, err on the side of love and grace. Amen. So we, we hate that Brother Rice couldn't be here. I guess if he's sick, he'd be called Dirty Rice, you reckon? <laughs> Amen. And uh, <laughs> y'all blessed to have him have Brother Doug, all these people just love God. There ain't nothing like it. Well, I'll get right into this and we're looking forward to what the Lord will do. And a power conference ought to be about power. Amen. I think one of the greatest tricks of Satan and the greatest weapon in his arsenal is to keep God's people ignorant of what we have in Christ. The victory he wrought for us to give us power and victory. I'm going to talk to you about being triumphant in Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel... And a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Here's the problem. He couldn't walk through that door. Because verse 13, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by uh, us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and them that, are, that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death and the other the savor of life unto life. Who is sufficient for these things? Now, when you study the apostle Paul, let me just say this. He's a master of typology, the allegory. He is a master of imagery. And he always uses something to illustrate the Christian life. He knew agriculture, used that a lot. Lord did too. The Lord preached by telling stories and asking questions. 
That's how Christ preached. And then Paul comes along, gives all these analogies and all this imagery. Talks about agriculture, talks about the financial system. He talks about sports, talks about warfare. And he knew a whole lot about sports and a whole lot about winning and a whole lot about victory. So he writes these verses here to illustrate what we have in Christ. And I thank God what we've got if we ever find out. Praise God. If we ever find out, we'll never be the same. Boy, when you find out who you are in him and what he's done for you, what he purchased for you, and the real defeat that Satan suffered on the cross 2,000 years ago, it'll change your life for time and for eternity. Now, Paul's speaking about an open door. That's what we all pray about, an open door. But if you got an open door, you need somebody to go through that door with you. And that's all that we're interested in is God's open door and what God would have us do. But the Bible says that Paul was restless in his spirit because Titus was not with him. No man is great enough to not need other people. Brother Winston done said it, church is a body. Your knee, or your, you need your knee to walk with, you need your feet, you need your toes, your hands, and uh, uh, only God knows what part of the body we are. But we need to be there and function, and function in unity, or one with another. Here's the background of these verses. Paul started the church in Corinth, and why, I'll never know. How in the world that people can be so thick-headed and stubborn that they don't even realize what they got? What about the children of Israel? They had no clue how great a man is or that Moses was until he died. And God had to hide his body or they'd have worshiped his grave and wanted to kill him when he's alive. That's where a lot of people are. Now, I don't think y'all that way. But here's the church of Corinth and they broke Paul's heart. I mean, many of these that he won to the Lord and then false prophets come in and turn them against this man of God that God used to start this church. There were problems that came up after his departure. So he writes a letter to help them. He's unsuccessful when he writes this letter. They write him a letter back. He responds to them again. And then Paul makes a personal visit of a cause. There was one man in the church sowing discord against him. This visit didn't go well. Paul called it a painful visit. And that forced him to go and write what he called a severe letter. But the whole church seemed to be rising up in mutiny against Paul. I mean, hey, when you love people, when you love your children, no matter how they love you back, you, it breaks your heart. It grieves you. And Paul is restless in his spirit over what's happening at Corinth. When you give your life, spend time, and put a lot of effort, and blood, sweat, and tears in a place, you get that bonding and that relationship with people. And when they turn from God and the ways of God, it breaks your heart. They attacked his character. They attacked who he was. So Paul, once again, promises to visit the church at Corinth. Instead of visiting them, he writes another letter. And this letter is a letter of rebuke. They needed to be disciplined, and Paul knew that. In his great distress, Paul sent this letter by Titus. Now he's waiting at Troas for Titus to show back up. He is burdened, restless in his spirit to find out if the letter done any good, if they repented or if they didn't repent. And Paul's a pulling for them. Boy, there's times in your life when you get sideways. You can get sideways at the preacher. You can get sideways with your family. You can get sideways with your church. And the easiest thing to do, just repent and say I'm wrong and now I'm sorry. But most people are too proud to do that in the day we're living in. Sometimes we just miss God and we need God to forgive us. Paul said, a great door's open unto me and I can't go through it. I can't preach. I'm too tore up on the inside. Now that's being tore up. Boy, he's carried. He said the care of all the churches was on him. Don't you ever forget how much how that a pastor of God's real man, how he carries the church on his shoulder. In the Old Testament, the great high priest had the stones of the 12 tribes of Israel, and he had it as a breastplate over his heart. 
Hey, your pastor carries you on his heart. Boy, when you do right, it rejoices him like nothing in this world. Having you not living up your potential, it'll grieve him, it'll hurt him. But most of all, we ought to live to, to please Christ. And we please Christ, we can please the pastor and please one another. But Paul's so depressed and so overwhelmed that he had the wind knocked out of him. He's so broken that he cannot preach. Man, you may be listening to me tonight. You've gone through grief that you never thought you could ever feel. There's some things you don't know how you respond to it happen. I was thinking the other day, years ago, had a man in the church die and uh, I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't know it would affect me like it did. It like to knock the wind out of me. I mean, I couldn't hardly preach his funeral. It was so devastating to me. And you never know how disappointment and distress and depression and defeat and danger and disbelief can knock the wind out of you. That's why we need times like this where God fills us back up and gives us the joy to go down the road. Satan can't do nothing with somebody got the joy of the Lord. Joy of the Lord's your strength. Amen. Praise God. Boy, we're high on the most high. Boy, we've taken a pill, but it's a gospel pill. I mean, God's been good to us, and the devil wants to knock the joy out of us. You done heard that tonight. Maybe a spouse broke your heart. Nobody broke your heart like family. It might be a child. It might be a business partner that betrayed you and ripped your heart out of shreds and, I mean, took money from you and tried to destroy your life. Some circumstances in life are so drastic that we feel betrayed and it takes time to get over it. But thank God, I'm glad we got a chapter in 2 Corinthians 2 about Paul that said, I got so restless and so out of heart I couldn't preach. So what Paul do? He remembered what he had in Christ. That's what you got to do. Boy, I like that song y'all sing that about remember. Boy, I remember. A lot of my memories ain't precious memories. That's right. But they're precious now because they're forgiven. Amen. Aren't you glad God forgives? Aren't you glad God wipes the slate clean? Thank God. Hallelujah. He knows how to wipe the slate clean. Amen. I love that song Larry Sparks sings, The Savior's Precious Blood. He says, make you forget that you ever sin. Boy, that's the greatness of forgiveness. You've got to remind yourself how wicked you used to be because you don't remember it. Other people might remember it, but your conscience can be so clear and so clean and your heart so clear. It's just as if you never committed sin like that. Who can't serve a God like that that makes you feel like that? Paul said, I was down, but I remember what I had in Christ. Remember who you are and remember whose you are. Amen. This world ain't even worthy of God's people. That's what the Bible said. The world's not worthy of them. In Hebrews chapter number 11, notice this song of praise. This is like the doxology. And this doxology is born out of the assurance that he trusted in God. That'll cause us to triumph. Now there's some truths that we all remember. And Paul's talking about the triumphant entry of a great general. He's talking about how that battle cry when they had come back, Rome had sent them out, they'd come back with a great victory. That's what that word triumph's all about. It's about somebody winning a victory that is so outstanding that they have a triumphal entry like a ticker take parade in New York City in World War II and that general celebrated and the people celebrate him and they celebrate his great victory, what he accomplished. That's what we're supposed to come to church to do, to celebrate our God and what he'd done for us 2,000 years ago. Thanks be unto God, which caused us to try always to try being Christ. Now, you may not feel like it, you got to remind yourself of these things. That's one of the big things to the Christian life. David talked to himself. When David got depressed in Psalm 42 and 43, he said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. Talk to yourself. Learn to talk to yourself. 
Tell your old soul, how dare you doubt God? How dare you be depressed after all the Lord's done for me? And my soul's been saved from hell. I'm glad, thank God, I'm going to get that, that, that down payment. What I, when, I got, when I got saved, the down payment's the earnest of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and God perfected my spirit. One day my soul will never sin again. My soul will be totally saved. And my body can be used as an instrument of unrighteousness. And I'm going to be resurrected and I'm going to be saved body, soul, and spirit. What a day that's going to be. The arena of victory. He's referring to the ancient custom of the Roman triumph. Paul's draw, drawing on this, uh, this victory to reflect on the victory we have in Christ. Now, dear people, he's not giving a history lesson just to be given a lesson. He's making the connection. That's the thing here. Whatever they've done in Rome, he's using it to make a connection of what we've got in Christ. And thank God we can understand sports, we can understand winning, we can understand victory. You know what they do in sports, don't you? They keep all those records. Why? Because to an American, victory's everything. You say, I come in second, that's the first loser. That's right. Americans, you know what, who was it? George Patton said, America, they are winners and they'll never accept a loser. Amen. Boy, we're winners. We should never accept defeat. Boy, we ought to say, God, you saved me to have victory and I want victory. Now, how did the Romans do this triumphant entry? There's a lot that went into this. There's a lot of planning. This was not done off the cuff. They didn't wing it. They put a lot of money and a lot of effort in honoring the Roman general that won great victory. Here's the story. If a, if a, if a Roman general on foreign soil Here's the qualifier. He had to have had a victory of killing at least 5,000 soldiers of the enemy. That would, that would uh, guarantee him and qualify him for a Roman triumphant entry. Then they'd send a heralder, a messenger, back to Rome. And that heralder, there's another word for that in the, in the New Testament. It's called the preacher. The preacher is a town crier. The preacher is the heralder. I mean, all this goes in line what God's had us to do. So this messenger, he sent back to Rome. He had run a long distance back to the city of Rome. He had proclaimed and announced the victory to the whole city, saying that a general has had a great victory. That's the word in the New Testament for preaching. Every time Brother Winston stands here, it's about telling the world about the victory our Savior won. We're the forerunner. We're like John the Baptist, John the Baptist, come tell him who he was, what he is going to do. But we shout to the world what he's done. Thank God. I like being on the winning team. I like being around winners. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Thank God for Jesus Christ. All he done to give us victory. Hey, like the winner's circle. That's what I got in when I got saved. The winner's circle. Amen. Amen. Once the heralder has proclaimed this great victory, the city would then begin to prepare for the Roman triumph. They would decorate a great arch and set it at the gate of the city. That's what Hitler used to do. That's what the great cities used to do. You've even got an arch in St. Louis, Missouri. That's the gateway to the West. Those arches mean something. And in that day, had that great arch of victory. And they'd decorate that arch. That would be what the general would come through. And the winning army, boy, he'd enter. You know what they called the gate that he entered into? They called it the Pompous Gate. Pompous Gate. Boy, that may come in pride. Boy, when our Lord comes back on that white horse, he ain't come hanging his head no more. Next time he comes, he's come to rule and reign. He's going to break bad on the devil and his enemies. Thank God we're going to be behind him in that great procession when he comes to the great pompous in Jerusalem to declare there'll be war no more once he gets wiping it up. Amen. Here's what people would do. So the general will come in through the gate pompous. They would line the city streets. 
On both sides, the route that was chosen was the most public street in Rome or the most traveled. They called it the Via Triumphant. That's the road that would be used when the general and the army and those involved will come marching through. So people are on both sides uh, cheering their great general. Can you imagine when this thing's over and the Lord sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem? I still believe in the premillennial coming of the Lord. I believe he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. Oh, I try to think about what, what the parade it's going to be when the Lord rides in that city and the saints of God and those little Jews that's been looking for him a long time. Man, you talk about a celebration. It's going to be a victorious parade in that day. Now, after that, the general come through, both sides lined up with all those cheering. Then there'd be the spoils of war. Hey, man, how can a man go into a strong man's house? That's Satan. Has full his goods, except he first bind the strong man. And he'll spoil his house. He'll take from him the armor in which he trusted. Aren't you glad that day you was held in Satan's prison? You were locked up in the chains of sin, and there's one greater than the devil marched in that day, that night, whenever God saved you and Christ pulled you for himself and backed Satan up against the wall and set you free by the power of his blood and the power of his name. So they bring the spoils of war. Soldiers carrying gold and silver, treasures from the conquered country. And then behind the spoils of war will come the POWs, the, those that have been conquered by the uh, uh, conquering general who would be held in chains. Uh, they, it wasn't long ago, they were proud soldiers of the enemy of Rome. And now they're being mocked as slaves scorned as slaves, humiliated. The Bible tells us one day there's coming a judgment in the book of Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. All the kings of the world, when they see the devil, they're going to say, they're going to narrowly look upon him and say, you mean that's him? You mean there's no more to him than that? I'm telling you, God Almighty shall humiliate our enemy and we'll see him discarded as the nothing he is that he come against our God and we'll shout the victory forever and ever what our Lord done for us. Now, after that, they brought those soldiers through there in chains. And the crowd, they were screaming, cheering the general. Now they're mocking, humiliating the enemy. Later, after that, they'd be marched down to a place called Circus Maximus, where they would be made fun of again. Lampooned and fed to hungry lions in the arena that was there. After that, the slaves in the parade would be of the victorious general. I mean those, of it, those slaves, those soldiers are humiliated to slavery. Here comes, here comes victory. Entering into the city, riding in a golden chariot is that conquering general. I got ahead of myself a while ago. There'd be a slave whispering to the conquering general in that gold chariot, saying, uh, uh, talking to him about the fleeting praises of men, to not take it personally that he's such a big shot, his soldiers help him win the victory. Our God, our Lord, I'll tell you something, the emperor didn't ride no golden chariot, the emperor rode on a white horse. Our Lord's coming on a white horse, ain't gonna be no slave uh, whispering in his ear that all these praises are fleeting and passing. Our God shall be praised forever and ever and ever. That's the imagery Paul is expressing here of what we got to look forward to. Amen. One hand, that general, that golden chariot would have the baton of victory. In the other hand, he'd have roses, flowers, somebody give him. You know, you got to get the women involved in flowers, you know. My mama loves flowers. She grows them. Boy, so here's all these adorning citizens as they throw rose petals and petals from white flowers. Chained to the victorious general is the defeated general. Chained to this victorious chariot 
He is the defeated general. The general chained to the chariot. How the victorious general will be stripped, number one, of all his armor. Now he's a nothing and a nobody. He'll be secondly stripped of all of his clothes. He's going to be absolutely shamed, totally subdued, defeated, and humiliated, stripped naked, mocked by the crowd, riding behind the victorious general. I'm telling you, God in his providence, probably let all this be set up, let you know, thank God, what's going to happen to the devil and his demons be aggravating us, harassing us, accusing us, lying to us about our God. Thank God, one day the tables are going to be turned forever and ever. Behind, I like his part, behind that general in that golden chariot on white horses were the children of the victorious general. Because the children would share in their father's victory. Now, dear sweet people, I'll tell you something. There's some things in the Bible. If the Bible didn't say it, I couldn't believe it. I absolutely couldn't believe it. But since it's in the Bible, I believe it. One of them is that God the Father loves us as much as he loves Christ. Now, that's out of here. That's how this world. Do you know that God the Father loves you, according to John 17, as much as his own son, because he sees you in him? I tell you, another verse blows my mind. We're heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Christ is God's, and Christ is ours. And all things are ours, what the Bible says. Everything Jesus Christ has, we got. That's in the Bible. You believe that? Heirs and joint heirs. We own this universe. Every one of y'all in here, can you imagine that? You own it all. Everything God's got, you own. You own it with Christ. My God in heaven. That's unbelievable. All over the city of Rome, once these men were coming through there, this being honored, all over that city would be priests with, with little buckets that would be burning incense everywhere. It's called the smell of victory. Had incense are going up, I mean, you couldn't go anywhere without smelling that. Oh, thank God, one of these days we'll experience the smell of victory forever and ever. Boy, man, you think about that sweet smell of victory. Man, that's what it smells like in that empty tomb. Amen. That's where that term, the sweet smell of victory, come from. Boy, the world just robs the, the Bible of all these sayings, and they just pervert it. But their custom, that's the custom behind this Roman triumphant. And Jesus, the Bible says, he made us to be triumphant in all things. He's making that comparison. Just like that general's triumphant. We're a whole lot more than that. That the people in Rome didn't share in his uh, victory like we're going to share in our Lord's victory. Man, you talk about a time when we shout the victory around the things of God. Hey, man, our general has won the victory forever and ever. The defeated victory is Satan. And Christ will absolutely humiliate him like nobody's ever been humiliated. You say, well, I think that's too harsh. Too harsh? How many people's he helped damn to hell? He about got you there. Are you going to have mercy on the devil? He's the enemy of God. He's the enemy of the God's people. He's the enemy of the lost man. He's the enemy of God and the enemy of Christ. I tell you, Jesus Christ didn't defeat 5,000 soldiers. That ain't why he's going to have a triumphant entry. He defeated all of them. Hey, he didn't kill you. He resurrected you. When you met him, you didn't get death. You got life. God's people can't die. We just pass away. Jesus said, either believe in me shall never die. Believe thou this? Yes, Lord, I believe that. I'll never die. One day I'll change residence forever and ever. It's going to be a promotion. It's going to be the best day ever happened when God's people leave this world. It'll be hard on your family. They'll miss you and that empty place will be there. But thank God for that child of God. It's a day of victory. Amen. Amen. We're the spoils of war. We're the ones riding on them white horses behind Christ. That's what the book of Revelation says. Are you seeing the connection here? 
how the Lord's making all this about him. That's the picture in 2 Corinthians 2, 14, 1 John 3, 8. He, commit us, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest. He might destroy the works of the devil. What Christ come to do to destroy the works of the devil? Why? He could have put him in hell ever any thousands of years ago that was when Satan thought he could kick God off the throne, but he didn't. Why? God's got a purpose for the devil. What's that? Antagonize you. That's right. That's right. You're not going to do it now. One day you'll thank God for the devil. Because without the devil, you never had any victory. You can't, over, you can't overcome if you ain't got opposition. What good's it going to be when it's Sunday night when the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles play one another? If only one team showed up, it wouldn't matter if they scored five points or 500 points. It don't mean anything because there's no opposition. And the Lord let the devil on this earth so that he can use, he knew we'd fall. He uses humanity and flesh to defeat the devil in all of his power. And God humiliates Satan by defeating him through us and through our obedience to him. Christ came to destroy. That means to render ineffective. Do you know the devil has no effect against you unless you let him have? We got the victory. Listen, it's like a policeman. Let's say a policeman's only five foot eight. He stands out here on the highway and stops all the traffic. He doesn't do that by his muscle. He doesn't do that by his strength. He does it by his authority. All the authority of North Carolina backs that man up to stop that traffic. And uh, that's the same way we are. It's not power in us. We enforce the victory that Jesus won 2,000 years ago. What prior does, it enforces the name of Christ and the blood of Christ and the victory of Christ against the enemy. That's why we pray. Oh, God, enforce that victory against the enemy. You give us the power to use your name. You give us the badge. The badge is the name of Christ. Amen. The authority of God against our enemy. Satan has no authority over you. You got authority over him, but he don't want you to find that out. First John 5, 4. Whatsoever, watch this now. If you don't understand this, you're going to get messed up in doctrine. Whatsoever is born of God. Your flesh ain't born of God. He ain't know about that. He's not talking about your soul. It's been saved from eternal destruction, but it ain't really been saved yet. You ain't enjoyed soul salvation yet. Your mind, will, and emotion can still sin. One day it will not. Whatsoever, whatever is a part of you that's not regenerated, that new nature and that new spirit, whatever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. If you're saved, Satan's power has been broken. You need to remind yourself of that. When he comes up, you say you're defeated, you're a liar, and the devil tells you to sin, tell him, no, no. That'll offend God and take a verse of scripture and quote it to him. In Ephesians 4, neither give place to the devil. But we don't, we're ignorant, folks. So many times about who we are and whose we are. Day one thing, he might rattle his tail, but he's been defamed. You say the devil's tempting me, it's because you're letting him. You can't feed your flesh and then beg God to keep you from sin. That you done defeated. God will give you the power not to, uh, not to go in that ABC store, He'll give you the power not to go buy those drugs. He'll give you the power to do what's right. That's what God does. He wants to use you as an instrument of victory. Christ is our source of victory. The Bible still says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. He won't flee unless you're submitted to God. And Satan knows it. He knows when you're submitted to the Lord. He knows when he don't have a point of accusation against you. You need to live in a way that Satan has no point of accusation of sin in your life to accuse you of. When your conscience is dirty, you don't have any boldness. When you got sin in your heart, you can't pray with boldness. 
We need to go to bed every night with a short sin list and say, God, forgive me. Last thing you need to do at night is pray or read the Bible, do something spiritual. The last thing you do when you close your eyes ought to be about God so you can wake up with your mind on God. Amen. We have the authority of Christ, the authority of his word, the authority of his spirit, the host of heaven, the angels of God fighting on our behalf. I've got to hurry. Victory of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Here's, you remember what it, what it said about that conquered general? They stripped him. They took his armor. They took his clothes. When they hung Christ on the cross, they stripped him to humiliate him. Here's what Christ done 2,000 years ago. Colossians 2.15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. He spoiled principalities. That means he stripped them. Again, the Lord's referring to this chain, subdued enemy of ours and of God's. Satan, again, his greatest weapon is to keep you ignorant. That's why I don't want you in the Bible. You get full of God's word, you get full of faith. You get full of faith, Satan can't handle you. Folks, you can't be an overcomer when you're overcome about all the time. Boy, you need some days that you don't consciously sin. Amen. Amen. You ain't got to sin every day. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, you ain't going to sin. You sin when you ain't full of the Holy Ghost. And I'm the same way. But God made you and equipped you that you could have victory. I know we sin in ways that God's so holy that we, I'm talking about conscious sin, deliberate sin. You don't have to deliberately disobey God. God's got power for you to live right. Let Satan should get an advantage of us. We're not ignorant of his devices. That means his schemes, his designs, his evil purposes, his thoughts, and his mind. We're not ignorant of that. Hey! When Satan comes whispers you something about Brother Winston, that ain't the Holy Ghost accusing him to you. The Holy Ghost don't divide churches. The Holy Spirit doesn't accuse your brother to you. He'll burden you for your brother. And you'll pray for your brother. You know, man, the devil come by telling you, he'll tell you everything everybody's saying about you. Boy, you must be important everybody talking about you. I mean, the whole world got their mind on you. That's what the devil tells you. Folks, why don't we find out who's talking to us? If you ever find out who's talking to you, you ain't going to listen to it. That's why Satan tries to play the Holy Ghost and makes makes you think it's your thoughts or the thoughts of God. Boy, we can't afford to be ignorant of our victory. Neither give place to the devil. We claim victory in Christ. We enforce the victory. The arena is Calvary. That's where Christ defeated him. Thank God the area of victory. Not just the arena, but the area. The Bible says in verse 14, I read you, in every place. We're to have victory everywhere. There's not to be anywhere we get overcome. That's a disgrace to our captain when we're defeated. Oh, Paul is talking about the areas of our life, making reference again to this incense being burned all over the city. I believe a Christian should be so sweet, sweet it's about like you can smell them coming. They said that great high priest, amen, when he's anointed with the oil on the great day of atonement, you can smell him coming a mile away, amen. God's people ought to have a sweetness about them. You come to church, you ought to have a sweetness about you. Oh, Paul said we can have the sweet smell of victory in every area of our life. Number one, we got victory over death. You don't have to be afraid of death. I'm not a bit afraid of death. I'm afraid of the process. I don't want to go through the process of that. I ain't afraid of, afraid of death. Man, that's going to put me in the place I've always wanted to be, but I don't like the process. I don't even think about getting dementia or, or Alzheimer's or being laid somewhere treated like you're some baby and somebody taking care of you. We fear the process, but even that God can get victory in that. All death can do to a believer is bring them in the presence of Christ because we've got spiritual life. You have the quicken who were dead in trespasses and in sin. Amen. For the believer, death is an investment. That's when you get your dividends. That's when God gives you a reward. You say, well, how many rewards do you think we're going to have? We're going to have Christ, and that's enough. Everything else is just dessert. 
to everything else I stand on the case. Thank God I got Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. I got Christ. What a reward. And we are his reward. Oh, Paul said, man, they need me so bad down here. But I'm wanting so bad to get up there. I'm in a straight betwixt two. To depart and be with Christ is far better. Boy, them Christians said, don't you pray that, Paul. Don't you pray that. We need you here. You're needed here. Don't you leave us. Paul's the same. God, you heard what they said. You're going to leave me. Man, I can't. Oh, Paul. Man, when he went in there, old Nero, going to behead him. He thinks he got Paul upset. Oh, Paul said, I've been waiting on this ever since I met him on the road to Damascus. Don't you threaten me with heaven. Cut her all right here. Like old Taylor Young, when the doctor told me that terminal cancer wouldn't live six months, he said, Doc, don't you threaten me with heaven. Hey, mate, that's what Paul said to Nero. You know why? Because Paul's already written, Old oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, great, where is thy victory? Death to the believer's the sweetest thing in 10 million worlds. The grave has no victory over us. Amen. Remember that old song, Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Amen. Brother Winston, here we go. They shuck his corn down the cob. I gotta get, get out of the way. That we got victory over death. We got victory over debt. I'm out of debt. Amen. Christ paid my debt off. Colossians 2, 13, you being dead in your sins, hath he quickened, that means to make alive, together with him, have forgiven your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance against us, which were contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. All my sins are gone. Amen. I believe Jesus paid it all. Blotting out the handwriting against us. You know what that means, don't you? When a man died on a cross, they nailed above him what he was accused of doing and why he was executed. You know what they hung above Christ, don't you? Jesus, the king of the Jews. That's why he's crucified. He is crucified by the Romans because he then wasn't any evidence, but they accused him of insurrection. And then the Jews accused him of making himself like God. Well, he was. He was the king of the Jews. I'll tell you, when Jesus hung that day, that official document was above his head of all the sin you ever committed. He paid it all, thank God. He paid the sin debt, and I'm out of debt, and you're out of debt if you're saved. Boy, the debt we signed. Yeah, when you borrowed money, you signed your name to it. We signed our name, and we got so far in hills over our debt, we couldn't have lived a million long times and paid ourselves out of it. You can't, you can't, you can't uh, alliterate, obliterate one sin. You can't die for one sin. We is in debt to God, and it was our transgressions. But thank God he was bruised for our iniquity. Hey, man wounded for our transgression. Thank God what I ought to pay, he paid. Hey, man, I'm saved by works, amen. You're saved by works, the works of Christ, amen. not yours, his. So these Armenians do have a right? We are saved by works, but it's his work. Amen. Praise God. You thought I was about to get in heresy there a minute, didn't you? <laughs> that I owes erased. In that day, they wrote things on papyrus and, and vellum paper. Since the ink didn't have acid, it wouldn't really soak into that paper. And uh, when they wanted to use that paper again, they'd take a wet rag and wipe that papyrus paper and it'd be blotted out, whatever was on it, cause there wasn't acid in that ink to get it into that paper. That's exactly what Christ done. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinance against us. We broke the law. We sinned. We sinned deliberately. We sinned willfully. All that sin we done, thank God Christ blotted it out because he paid for it. Because of the cross, we got victory over death. We got victory over debt. And thirdly, we got victory over the difficulties of our life. Again, let me say this as I try to close this down. You can't have victory, folks. You can't have triumph unless you face difficulty and opposition and overcome it. See, that's what this life's about. God could have took you to heaven when you got saved. 
He left you here to make a trophy of grace out of you, not just to save you by grace, but to give you victory over his enemy. This thing like Job, this thing behind the scenes between God and Satan. And we're all like Job to a certain point. The devil saying he can get us to forsake Christ, turn our back on Christ, and God saying, no, you can't. Boy, we live for God. We bring great honor and glory to God. And God can look at the devil and say, you lost again. Amen. You lost again. So when Paul was thanking God for the victory, he was facing some of the greatest opposition of his life. 2 Corinthians 4 eight. we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. He said, I was hard pressed, afflicted, and troubled on every side. He said, but not distressed. That means I wasn't crushed. I've been knocked down, but I ain't been knocked out. Thank God. I'll get knocked down again, but thank God for God's grace, I'll never be knocked out. Perplexed. That means to be without resources. To be bewildered. To not know which way to go. <laughs> Boy, we've been there. Lord, have mercy. But not in despair. That means... That means knock down to the point we can't get up. Circumstances might knock us down, but again, they don't knock us out. Then lastly, the arena of victory, the area of victory, and the Roma of victory. We're under God a sweet smell and savor of Christ in them that are saved and them that perish. To the one we're a savor of death and of death and the other the savor of life and of death. Life, who is sufficient for these things? Here we go again, the imagery of the triumph. The Roman triumph. He's talking about that sweet smell of victory. That sweet fragrance that we have in Christ. The life of Christ was like a sweet smell and savor unto God. His life of obedience, his life of faith, his life of sacrifice, his life of perfection and humility was a sweet smell and savor to the Father. And that's what God says. When you deny yourself, you denied yourself to be here tonight. You could have stayed home. Some of y'all gave money in the offering plate. You could have kept it. Some of y'all prayed prayers. You didn't have to do that. But that's a sweet smell in the nostrils of God. Amen. The beauty of living a life pleasing unto God. Thank God that, that Old Testament incense was unique in the fact that it had a special uh, recipe. And when our life is sweet unto God, it's that special recipe of faith, grace, Power, the Holy Ghost, making our life pleasing unto the Lord. Amen. Now, here we go. To the overcoming victorious army, that incense was a savor of life unto life. But to that defeated army, that incense was a savor of death unto death. Yeah. It's just according to which side you own. Amen. Oh, Lord. What a blessing to be victorious. Satan's running the sinking ship. I praise God, God give, give me enough stiff sense to jump off of it. You say there ain't nothing will jump off a sinking ship, but rats, if you got any sense, you'll jump off one. Amen. The victory of Christ is our victory. Let me give you this illustration. Someone come and play something. Man, I've enjoyed this singing tonight. Amen. There was a man who once was a citizen of France. That means, and that was in the days of Napoleon Bonaparte. You know what God let him do? God let the little general, that little punk, go to Egypt, go around the world, go to Russia, bankrupt France, so that he would sell New France, which is bigger than New England, to Thomas Jefferson. It's called the Louisiana, Pur Louisiana Purchase. And we got New Orleans. We got the port. That's when Britain come back over here trying to feed us a second time, burning down our capital and burning Baltimore and Washington all up north. And then they come to New Orleans where they got their last stand. Oh, they met old Hickory called Andrew Jackson. And God got on our side through the weather. And we won. And we gained New Orleans. And it opened up the whole west to the United States. Because God bankrupt the little general, the little Bonaparte. While this man, literal true story, was a citizen of France, 
Waterloo was his defeat. But he left France, went to England, become a British citizen. Now Waterloo is his victory when it used to be his defeat. That's us. We were on the side of the losers. We didn't even realize the mess we was in. <laughs> but tonight, we're on the side of victory. Dear sweet people, live like it. God, the Holy Ghost, has been sent by Christ. Jesus was sent by the Father, and the Holy Spirit sent by Christ. And he sent him into this world to call him out a bride. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He's calling out a bride for Christ. And he's taking that bride and filling that bride and giving her the robes of holiness, gratitude, generosity, thanksgiving and praise so that that bride can practice getting ready for the bridegroom. And the Spirit of God gets so grieved when we won't cooperate with him as he wants to give us the victory so we can be trophies of grace. Now we're going to shout forever. We ain't going to, we ain't going to quibble over that. We're going to shout forever that God saved us. But some of y'all are going to shout over the victory God gave you after he saved you. And he used you. And power conference is getting power on you so you can live in victory. Can I pick on somebody, Brother Winston? See Sister Donna up here? <laughs> that won't make you jealous now, me using her for an example with it. Hey, Brother Ralph had a man, I was preaching for a man one time, I've told this story a few times, I was preaching for a man. And God really anointed me that night, I mean just power, extraordinary power. You want know that pastor? There's a pile of young people and preachers there. You know what that pastor got up and said? He said, you know I love this man? He said, well he preached right there, I know what it cost him. You see Sister Don up here acting like she does? We know what it cost her. You hear Brother Ralph preaching the Holy Ghost this morning like he did? We know what it cost him. When we see Brother Winston acting like wisdom of a seven-year-old man, we praise God. We give glory to God. We know what it's cost him and Miranda. It's cost him. And it's worth the cost. Amen. Praise God. It's worth the cost. Is it worth it to you? See, if I can just get to heaven, get to heaven by the skin of my teeth, you ain't going to say that foolishness when you get there. Oh, no. Ain't got me. Oh, God, I'm glad I'm here by the skin of my teeth. Yeah, it's about you and your selfishness. You're going to want some crowns to lay at his feet of gratitude. And once you lay your crowns at his feet, Brother Winston, he's going to say now that you show me how much you love them, put them back on. They're yours. You earned them. He's going to give them back. We're going to rule and reign for all eternity. God, I love winning. I hate losing. It's worse than cancer. I hate losing. Amen. But I love victory. Oh, Old Brother Bartley wrote that song, Victory in Jesus. Old Brother Dole Turner, led singer for Dr. Percy Ray for over 50 years. He was going to singing school. And, and, and like a professional singing school teacher, his teacher was that man that wrote Victory in Jesus. Here goes a heard an old, old story. Thank God, I still love to hear that same old story. I mean, we come to church every Sunday and shout at the preacher and he shouts back at us. He's preaching the same old story. I heard an old, old story. How the Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch. I wish there's a word to put us lower than that. A wretch like me. Hey, man, folks. He died to give you the victory. Let's bow our heads, will you? And this altar's open. Jesus died to give you the victory. You ought, you ought to want it. You will say, God, I want to not just exist. I'm tired of being defeated. I want to get into that victory. Jesus died to get me. Boy, this church gets to walking in that victory. Some of you people in here, you got to praying. 
you're feeling a measure of that victory, go all the way with it. Go all the way with it. Go all the way with it. If you need this altar, you come. Brother Winston, I love you, huh? Thank God for you. I love you, preacher. I know you do. I love you. Thank you for preaching.